Welcome. My name is Henry Solano. I'm a lecturer in public policy here at the Kennedy School, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to the ARCO Forum uh, for our discussion on Hispanics and the American business community, um, which is sponsored, co-sponsored by the Harvard Forum on Hispanic Affairs and the Institute of Politics. Our speakers, and I wish to welcome you here, are Alfredo Estrada, founder and editor of Hispanic Magazine, Jose Nino, Jose Nino, uh, President, U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and Catherine Davalos Ortega, former Treasurer of the United States. Good. A very impressive panel, indeed. Um, what I will do is uh, just give you a brief description and biography of each of our speakers, and then after I conclude, the first speaker will come forward and each one will then, after that speaker finishes, come forward to give their presentation. And then at the end, we would like to open it up for question and answers. Our first speaker will be Alfredo Estrada, who is, as I said, the founder, editor, and publisher of Hispanic Magazine, which is based in Washington, D.C. Hispanic is a monthly magazine for and about Hispanics, written in English, with a national readership of approximately or over 500,000. Prior to founding Hispanic, Mr. Estrada practiced law in New York City and Washington, D.C., where he specialized in immigration law and legislative matters relating to Latin America. Mr. Estrada represented clients in political asylum hearings and in pro bono matters for public service groups such as the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights and the Legal Aid Society. Hispanic was launched in April of 1988 since its founding Hispanic has uh, won wide acceptance among readers and advertisers and is the largest and fastest growing English language monthly publication for Hispanics in the United States. Mr. Estrada will speak generally on, and give a general overview of Hispanics and business and in particular discuss the challenges that he has seen and faced in starting a business, especially one in the journalistic field. Our second speaker, as I said, is Jose Nino who was elected as president of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in the spring of 1990. He has an extensive background with Hispanic business and professional organizations and is a small business owner. Mr. Nino sits on numerous boards and committees, including the U.S. Department of Commerce Minority Economic Development Advisory Committee, the United States Senate Republican Task Force on Hispanic Affairs, the United States Democratic Task Force on Hispanic Affairs, a rather balanced approach, Jose, I would say. Um, the neutral. Yeah. Um, uh, the National Easter Seals Corporate Advisory Board, the Board of Directors of the Public Education Fund Network, the National Alliance of Business Roundtable for Education, and NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, Vista Institute of Hispanic Studies, the Board of Directors of Take Pride USA, among others. Mr. Nino will also speak on small business issues as they relate to Hispanics and discuss a little more the, uh, what the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce does. Catherine Davalos Ortega was appointed by President Reagan and confirmed by the Senate, and when that happened, she served as the 38th Treasurer of the United States serving from September 1983 through June 1989. As treasurer, she had both management and policy responsibilities for three of the divisions uh, of the Department of Treasury's uh, major bureaus. These included the U.S. Mint, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and if you have any samples, I would take those after our discussion, <laughs> Catherine, um, and the U.S. Savings Bonds Division. For her service as U.S. Treasurer, uh, the uh, Secretary of the Treasury presented her with the Alexander Hamilton Award, the department's highest honor. Prior to, uh, to her appointment as Treasurer of the United States, Ms. Ortega served as a commissioner of the Copyright Royalty Tribunal and as a member of the President's Advisory Committee on Small and Minority Business. Before entering government, Ms. Ortega practiced as a certified public accountant with the prestigious firm of Pete Marwick Mitchell & Company in Los Angeles she served as Vice President of the Pan American National Bank of Los Angeles and then as President and Director of Santa Ana State Bank. She currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Diamond Shamrock Corporation, Ralston Purina Company, The Kruger Company, Catalyst, Quest International, 
Southwest Voter Registration Institute and is a member of the Comptroller General's Consultant Panel and the National Park Systems Advisory Board. Appointed by President Bush, she served as an alternate representative to the United Nations General Assembly during 1990 to 91. Ms. Ortega will discuss information concerning Hispanic women and uh, business, both the successes, I hope, many, and the challenges. Those are our three speakers. And Alfredo, if you could please begin. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've been told to keep our remarks uh, blessedly brief. And, and I want to really encourage you to ask questions afterwards, because many of the issues that we'll talk about, I think, are things that, that, that need to be discussed. And, and in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in what you think about, about some, some of these issues. Uh, it's, as a Harvard graduate, it's always a pleasure for me to, to uh, uh, return here, uh, and particularly in the company of, of uh, Ms. Davalos Ortega and, and Mr. Nino, both of whom have been on the cover of, of Hispanic magazine. So that's, that's a measure of distinction, uh, I guess. And, and, um, and in fact, I might point out to your attention that uh, in the current issue, we feature Edmundo Gonzalez. And, and I want to thank him for, for, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, to give you a bit of, uh, a bit of background, uh, Hispanic Magazine uh, is based in Washington, D.C. It, it's uh, a national magazine for and about Hispanics. Bear in mind that there, there are about 30 million uh, Hispanics in this country today. Our magazine targets a very specific segment of that, of that community. Uh, with a readership of only 500,000, it's essential that we, that we uh, establish a market niche. Our readers are, are Hispanics, um, I might presume somewhat like, like yourselves, um, professional Hispanics, uh, college-educated Hispanics, uh, Hispanics primarily born in this country or have lived here for, for several years, uh, Hispanics who are very much in the mainstream of, of uh, life, uh, economic life, political life, cultural life, but retain a strong Hispanic identity. Editorially, the magazine speaks to that uh, identity. Uh, being five years old now, uh, which is relatively young for a magazine, uh, I'd like to share with you some of our experiences in, in starting the magazine and where, uh, where we're heading and how that reflects on, on some of the issues of, of Hispanic in business. Um, I recall when, when we started the magazine um, almost five years ago, one of the first questions people asked was, why Hispanic magazine? Bear in mind the magazine business is, is one of the riskiest businesses around. Nine out of ten new magazines uh, go out of business in the first year. Now, every year there are about 500 new magazines that, that, that start up. Uh, most of this is due to desktop publishing, which makes it very easy and very cost-effective to start a magazine. But of those 500 new magazines, nine out of ten will, will go out of business. Add that to um, the increasing risk of running a minority business. Um, again, the difficulties of, of getting capital, of getting, getting qualified um, people, getting people to believe in, in, in your business. You can see what, what we were up against. But, but we were committed uh, to the idea of a magazine that would reach out to the Hispanic community. Uh, our goal was then, as it is now, in a sense, to be the voice of the Hispanic community and to present a, a, a balanced, uh, objective and entertaining portrait of our community. Part of the need for that um, comes from the, the, uh, the, the negative images that, that surround us, particularly in general market media. Uh, we, we did a story a couple of months ago, we called it Bad News, and specifically we, we looked at, at five major uh, metropolitan newspapers across the country, New York and Los Angeles, um, San Antonio, Washington DC, and, and Chicago, and we took a week um, and we read the newspapers cover to cover. And this was a week at the, the last week in, in August that we, that we looked at this. And we analyzed the types of stories they ran about Hispanics. Uh, it, it, it confirmed certainly my suspicions that, that the, the, the majority of coverage about Hispanics is, is pretty negative. You're, you're much more likely to read about, for example, a, a Hispanic drug dealer than a Hispanic entrepreneur. Uh, you're much more likely to read about a a Hispanic undocumented immigrant than a Hispanic political leader, just as a matter of course. Now, it, it can be argued that, that, that uh, media in this country today has become very uh, sensationalist, has become very, very negative, um, and, that's, and that's certainly true. I mean, it's amazing to me how, how certain stories, um, I mean, how, how many times can you read about the, 
the deranged cult in Waco and, 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 and that, that type of thing. I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do as opposed to the positive images. But, but uh, in the minority community, it's particularly to the fact that there are very few Hispanics, for example, in the newsroom uh, as editors of major publications. We felt that there was a need to present a more positive uh, side of our community. And let me tell you why, why I think that's, um, that's very important. I, I can see it uh, very clearly in, in the field of education. 45% uh, of, of young Hispanics drop out of high school. Those of you here at an institution like Harvard should consider yourselves very, very fortunate uh, in, in, in that regard. And I remember speaking to a teacher in El Paso in a school district that was 95% Hispanic, and she had asked her students to, to name 10 positive role models. One kid was a baseball fan, so he named Jose Canseco. Another had been watching Miami Vice reruns, so he named Eddie Olmos. And that was it. They couldn't name any other positive role models. In every issue of Hispanic magazine, there are, there are 50 role models, uh, Hispanics succeeding in the world of business, politics, the arts. That image is very important to our young people. If they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, if they don't see what they can accomplish through education, they won't have that motivation. I see it very clearly as well in, in, in the business world. Um, many of you in a few years may be applying for a job at a Fortune 500 company. If the image that the senior VP of that company or the CEO of that company sees of Hispanics is of a uh, drug dealer, is of an illegal immigrant, he's that less likely or she's that less likely to, to seriously consider your job application. The image we'd like to put in front of an individual like that, a CEO of Fortune 500 company, is a more positive, balanced image. We'd like, to, we'd, we'd like that person to see what Hispanics have accomplished through hard work um, through education, through their commitment to excellence. That's what the magazine is all about um, ed editorially. Uh, certainly at, at, at the beginning, uh, we face what, what many other uh, small businesses um, face, which is simply to, to keep going. Um, a, a magazine, is many people think of it as a, as a foot race. It's, it's, it can be, uh, it appears very, very glamorous. Uh, it, it's high visibility. You get to interview um, all kinds of different people. It, it, it's a real numbers crunching business, and it's not a foot race. It's, it's a marathon. I mean, if you're still around uh, in, in, in five years, then, then many see that as a, as a, as a signal that you've, that you've made it. Um, the next step, however, is even more difficult, which is to establish uh, the editorial credibility of the magazine. Um, once once the, 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 uh, the survival aspect is assured and you know you will be around, then it becomes that much more important to really have editorial credibility, have people to believe in your product, have people see your, your magazine as an information resource for the Hispanic community. So I, I see that as our goal uh, in, in, uh, in, in the next five years. But, but all of you uh, here today um, are really part of a very exciting trend in this, in this, in this country now. Um, it, it's, it's been called the demographic explosion. Uh, in, in the last census, between 1980 and 1990, the Hispanic population was 59 percent, uh, five times more than the rest of the country. Uh, and it's not just the numbers, it's, it's the achievements of Hispanics in the, in, in the arts and politics and business. Um, Henry Cisneros, former mayor of San Antonio, now the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, has called this the Hispanization of America. Let, let, let me explain what, what, what that means. Um, by, by the Hispanization of America, I don't mean to imply that, that Hispanics will in some day be, be a majority or that, that uh, we will all become, become Hispanics. So maybe that's not such a bad idea. And in fact, in, in, in some states, for example, in Texas, one in four people are Hispanic. In, in California, one in four people are, are, are Hispanic. But by the Hispanization of America, I mean that Hispanics are having an indelible impact in the fabric of this nation's life. You can see it when you turn on the radio and listen to Gloria Stefan and the Miami Sound Machine, a Pulitzer Prize winning author such as Oscar Ijuelos, he wrote uh, The Mambo Kings, uh, leaders such as Henry Cisneros and Federico Peña, uh, Secretary of Transportation. Um, I, I think uh, for me the, the, the crowning moment was when I went to Mexico City and saw a Taco Bell in Mexico City. Now when you can go to Mexico City and order a taco from Taco Bell, you can truly see that Hispanics have arrived. But, but, but certainly this process of the Hispanization of America will, will continue uh, in this decade and the decade to come. And, and at Hispanic Magazine, we see ourselves as, as our mission is to chronicle this continuing Hispanization of America, the growth of, of, of the Hispanic community in, in these various areas. And all of you are, are part of that. 
and I commend you for your participation uh, in, in this event. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por esta invitación. Quiero decirles que a mí me da mucho orgullo poder venir aquí y ver que de costa a costa estamos en todas partes, como hispanos, como latinos, poder venir aquí y compartir uno con otro. A ustedes muchas gracias otra vez. For those of you that are uh, linguistically handicapped, I just uh, like to thank you for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, it's, it is a privilege for me, being the president of the USHCC, to travel from coast to coast and meet so many, so many Latinos and so many Hispanics all over the country. And everybody, in their own way, doing something, something really good, not only for themselves, their communities, but for America. My particular realm is that of business. And as much as I like to, to talk about the fact that Hispanic business, uh, and looking to the future of how big we can get, bottom line is that the majority of the people that I represent are not small business, but tiny business, micro business. However, these are the people that uh, have sent us off to school. These are the people that, uh, that, that have really worked hard and employ the majority of our community. Um, let me give you a little bit of history first about Hispanic business in this country. Hispanic business in this country, if you want to look at it from the aspect of, uh, wow, gee, it's so unfair that there's not that many of us, or uh, look at it from the position of what a great opportunity we've had and what a greater opportunity we're going to have. Uh, for two reasons. Number one is the growth of our population, this reproduction activity that we got going on in the community. Uh, it's really something, and it, it presents opportunity because in the 70s, the greatest secret that was kept was kept by the utility companies of America and the Grocers Association of America because they fed us and they uh, provided us with uh, electricity and gas and so on. And throughout all that time, in our communities as we were growing, they were not coming into our communities heavily to give us the, the goods and services that we wanted. They talk about this fact that the North American Free Trade Agreement and international trade, well, I got news for them. We were importing tortillas and chiles and so on and products from all these countries where we came from, where our parents came from, for years. So we're way ahead of them in that aspect. But what I want to tell you is that because of the fact that our community grew so much, it gave us an opportunity to start our own businesses, to uh, get uh, our own plumbing companies, our own restaurants, our own um, uh, companies that would provide whatever little product that nobody else would come into our neighborhoods to provide it. Because whether they were scared or whether they thought it was a tough neighborhood, uh, or because they probably just associated that we were able to get these things where everybody else would get them. Not true. Not to the point that I could tell you, and let me give you a few statistics here, that in 1982 to 1987, we started out with 269,000 businesses, but by, within five years, we had grown to 450,000 businesses. Actually, 420,000, and from 87 to 91, we kept on growing at a continuous rate of a little bit over 80%. And today, we're over 650,000 Hispanic-owned businesses in America. And we do sales of over $35 billion. Our projection looks pretty good for the future. We had uh, Demographics Inc. out of Denver, Colorado do a study for us. And our projections are that by the year 2000, there will be close to a million Hispanic-owned businesses doing between 80 to $85 billion in, in products and sales. And that is a tremendous opportunity for us, and better yet, a tremendous opportunity for you who will be coming into the job market, who will be coming into the, the business sector within the next few years, going into the next millennium. Um, what do we do, who are we? The United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is an umbrella organization for about 200 Hispanic business organizations and chambers of commerce. Um, we're across. America. We have uh, chambers located anywhere from Connecticut to Salt Lake City, Utah, from Florida to Seattle, Washington, down to Texas, K 
California into New York City. So we're pretty much uh, been expanding all over the country. And we have members in about, I believe it's 39 states now. The USACC is an advocacy group. We advocate business for Hispanic business. We assist our business owners and our members, number one, in procuring business from corporate America, number two, opening doors for them with the federal government uh, so they can do business with the government, and number three is advocating between them. And what I mean by that, I, I sincerely believe that the greatest thing that the USHC has ever done is that it has brought together uh, Cubanos with Mexicans, with Puerto Ricanos, with uh, South Americans, and so on, uh, under a networking process and true networking so that they can do business amongst each other and to truly believe and can see that we can work together. But what's the common denominator that brought us all together? It, it, it's not our Spanish language because we all have different dialects. It, it's not our culture because uh, we all have different cultures. So the bottom line that brought us together was dollar, the dollar, green, how much money, money. You know, it's okay to make money. And uh, a lot of people got a problem with that, I believe, because in, even in our community, whenever, whenever somebody makes money, you know, they want to keep it a secret. And they don't want anybody else to know where they made their money. Well, you come join us. If you need assistance in helping you where to find money or helping you uh, where to go where there's a contract to get money, well, that's where we come in. Because we don't have a problem introducing you to anybody we know that you want to meet so that you can possibly cut a deal. That's what's called networking. And we do it all the time from uh, ourselves that we hold our national convention, which, by the way, this year our national convention, is, it's an advertising moment here, in New York City, uh, September 22nd to the 25th. And we invite all of you to come there and be with us. We will have corporate America with us. We'll have Hispanic business owners with us. And we'll have seminars on how to, how to do the things I'm telling you. Um, but we don't have a problem with that because through networking, sooner or later somebody else is going to find out uh, other ways to do business, how to make it better, where to go and get it. But we want to participate with it, with it because later on you could help us. And, and that's what we project as we go forward. The USACC hosts seminars on how-tos for all types of business opportunities. Uh, matchmaking sessions with corporate America. And we also advocate those things that really hurt Hispanic business uh, in Washington. Those uh, laws that concern us anywhere from um, uh, the EPA laws to the Department of Defense to small business, the 8A program so we can participate and try and get a, a minority participation on contracts. All these things we, we help advocate the concerns of our business owners uh, throughout the country. And the latest one that we're doing is uh, we're knocking on the doors of all the franchisors because we want to have our Hispanic business owners and our Hispanics in general participate in franchising. Franchising is a great opportunity. They're turnkey operations, and it's a, kind of a step-by-step -step on how to do business for a particular product. And for that, uh, we're also participating heavily to open those doors for you. We, uh, we extend into the national realm, international realm, rather, uh, by doing agreements with other countries. We participate uh, heavily with Mexico uh, and Latin American countries to the uh, Camacol, the Hemispheric Congress down in Miami. Uh, Puerto Rican business owners are part of the U.S., so the business owners in Puerto Rico come under our umbrella. Uh, Los Detallistas de Puerto Rico, their association, Productos de Puerto Rico, uh, we, we have very good relationships with them and we work together. What is the future of international? First of all, we're pro-business, we're pro-international trade. Uh, we are for the North American Free Trade Agreement as it is written by all three countries, as it was signed by all three countries. We understand the fact that the president is negotiating separate deals on um, a separate negotiation on labor and environment. Uh, however, from a business point of view, uh, we are for international trade and open trade, open free trade. Uh, but we're one step ahead of them. As I mentioned at the beginning, we've been importing products and moving back and forth for years. Uh, and what we're doing at the USACC is we're matchmaking Hispanic business owners from the United States with Hispanic owners or Mexican owners down in Mexico doing joint ventures between them so that they can do business and showing everybody, hey, we got a victory here. Uh, we're way ahead of you. We're already doing business. And let me tell you that it falls under our program that we call our Sanchez to Sanchez to Smith program. We're Sanchez of Mexico, 
Sousta Sanchez of the United States within Sousta Smith, and vice versa. Uh, and it works. And let me tell you, we're, we're moving it forward. Um, we're moving it forward. It works. And we shall continue to promote it so that we can move way ahead of this North American Free Trade Agreement. It's something that cannot be stopped because it's part of the globalization that's going around the world. Uh, the world is getting smaller. Telecommunications is, is speeding up. Air travel is fast. And you are, are now at an opportunity that we did not have 10 years ago. And even five years ago was even limited to a point. Uh, the fact that the former Soviet Union has come down, uh, other communist countries have opened up to, uh, to trade, to doing business, this is going to bring tremendous opportunity for you. One thing I recommend to everybody in this class or in this audience today is take an international class uh, as an elective. If it's not in your major, take one, take two, take three international classes. You're going to see how no matter what you do in the field of, uh, of education that you're dealing with, sooner or later you might have an opportunity to deal in international trade through what you know in that particular subject. Uh, so get the basics out of it. it. It'll probably make you some extra money down the road. Um, and I like to tell you that, again, that his small business, we hire more people than all the corporations in America put together. Uh, small business is the backbone of this country. And when you, when you have a small business or a tiny business, not only are you employing yourself, but you're probably employing a couple other people. And, and that's what, what it really, what's really all about. That's what really makes this country going. And that's what really, what really motivates the economy, uh, the economic, the economy of scales to move and balance either direction uh, as to how well we perform or, or how well we've been staying in business. Um, I can tell you here as a, I'm in front of you that you gotta, you're going to have to set your own goals, but you have your teachers and everybody else, your parents to tell you that. I can tell you that your limitations is probably the limitations that you set upon yourself, uh, but you already know all of that. All I can do tell you is that as you move forward in business with Hispanic business or in any business, if you're results oriented and you don't worry about who's getting the credit, let the results speak for themselves and you'll make a lot of money and you'll make a lot of friends and you're gonna see that everybody else will notice and they'll come to you and, and thank you for it and they'll come to you and cut the deals with you. So don't worry about all of that. Just be results oriented and, and, and never get mad. Don't get mad and worse, don't get even. Negotiate. Work it out. There's not that many of us that we can afford to lose anybody. Muchas gracias. Well, first let me say I am certainly delighted to be here this afternoon with you. And I would like to speak on Hispanic women in business. And the observations I will make here today are personal and therefore they're dependent upon my personal experience and background. So I would like to share with you some of my background in order to assist you in understanding my viewpoints. I grew up near Alamogordo, New Mexico as the youngest of nine exposed to the business community from a very early age. My father operated his own blacksmith shop, and my mother and older brothers and sisters operated a restaurant and a dance hall. My father later entered the retail furniture business, and my oldest brother eventually took over that business. My oldest sister used to help my father with the bookkeeping and went on to become a certified public accountant. My youngest brother and I followed in her footsteps and also became CPAs. My sister and her brother then had their own accounting practice until 1973 when it was sold and at that time my sister organized a savings and loan organization. And it's interesting that when she was applying for the charter and submitted all the projections that were required, all the data that was required, the uh, state um, savings and loan organization that was responsible for issuing the charter uh, advised her that her projections were wrong because in her five-year projections, 
she stated that she was going to make a profit from year one, and they told her that was not possible. So she went back, changed the figures, resubmitted, received her charter, and proved them wrong. She showed a profit from year one. She continued as its chairman and chief executive officer until 1988 when it was sold. And I, while I was in school during these, uh, this period, I worked in the restaurant at a very early age in a local bank in an accounting firm. And then after college, I had the good fortune to go to Pete Marwick Mitchell and Company in Los Angeles as a tax supervisor. And one of the accounts that I handled was that of the chairman of the board of Pan American National Bank in East Los Angeles. I was invited to join that bank as vice president and cashier in charge of operations when they were looking for someone with a strong accounting background. I thus became the first uh, senior woman bank officer at that bank. This was in 1972, and at that time, the former chairman of that particular bank, Romana Acosta Banuelos, was in Washington serving as treasurer under President Nixon. Upon her return, she was instrumental in my election as president and director of the Santa Ana State Bank in California. Then in 1982, I came to Washington when I was appointed a commissioner uh, by President Reagan to the Copyright Royalty Tribunal. And uh, later that same year, I was then appointed as treasurer of the United States and served until June of 1989. And since that time, I have been serving on numerous nonprofit and uh, three corporate boards. So you can see that my career has consisted of education, hard work, and to be sure, a great deal of good luck. And I think these uh, factors are critical to me, and in this regard, I would like to reflect on the careers of other Hispanic women as examples of superior achievement. Two of the most successful Hispanic women that I know each attribute their success to the fact that they had a strong desire to control their destinies. They wanted to make their own decisions without having to consult with others. They are both strong-willed and goal-oriented, and they're always looking for individuals who are willing to look for ways to get the job done, no matter what the obstacles. And working seven days a week to establish their businesses, they have never lacked self-confidence. Their personalities differ, as do their styles. One has used the military style of management, while the other the participatory type. However, they both attribute their success in large part to the support that they have received from their families. Mrs. Banuelos, whom I mentioned earlier, started her business with $400 as a young single parent with two children. Today, her children manage the $13 million a year Mexican food products business, and with the earnings and profits over the years, she is now the president and chairman of Pan American, National, Pan American Bank in East Los Angeles and she holds the controlling interest of that financial institution. Another extremely successful woman is Nympha Lorenzo of Houston, Texas, who started her restaurant business with 10 tables 20 years ago. Today, she and her children own and manage 33 restaurants. And both of these women were denied bank loans when they first started but they have the tenacity to continue in spite of the many obstacles and barriers that they encountered. And I am sure that there are many stories like these, but what we can learn from them is that when one has a strong desire to succeed and the willingness to make the sacrifices necessary, success surely follows. 
Information on Hispanic women in business is not widely available. However, Hispanic Business Magazine reports that the 1987 Economic Census Survey of Minority-Owned Business Enterprises shows 388,309 businesses owned by minority women, of which 115,025 or 29.4 percent are owned by Hispanic women. Black women, on the other hand, own 158,278 or 40.4 percent of the businesses owned by minority women. The numbers in the corporate community are also not encouraging. The Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility whose goal is to achieve economic parity for the Hispanic community, commensurate with its expanding presence in the areas of employment, procurement, governance, and business opportunity, recently conducted a survey of the Fortune 1000. It found that Hispanic women, as well as Hispanics in general, are conspicuously absent from their boards of directors, as well as from executive positions. The Fortune 1000 account for 11,587 director seats, of which 84 are held by Hispanics. The 84 seats are actually served by 58 Hispanic directors, since some individuals serve on multiple boards. Of the 58 Hispanic directors, seven are women. Of the 12,894 executive positions, 69 are held by Hispanics, of which 11 are women. I have little doubt that we all come to the same conclusion, and that is Hispanic women have not fared well in business. But then all women face the usual difficulties in the employment area vis-a-vis -vis the, the males. Catalyst, a women's research organization whose mission has been since its inception 30 years ago to provide women with options so that they can do what they choose with their lives, has always focused on two related and equally areas of concern. And the first is the upward mobility of women, clearing the path so that women can move as far as their talents and commitment can take them. The second is enabling each woman to establish the balance of career and family that makes personal sense for her. One of the recent studies conducted by Catalyst was to examine the current status of women in the ranks of corporate management and CEOs' perceptions of the qualities women need to succeed. In response to one of the questions in the survey, CEOs most frequently cited the increased presence of talented women and the need to use the most talented human, human resources available as a motivation to increase the representation of women in management. And this was somewhat of a surprise in light of the widespread awareness of the changing demographics of the American workforce. The CEOs recognized that women do not experience a level playing field in competing with men for development opportunities and promotion. And they identified barriers to women's advancement, which included the well-known stereotyping, preconceptions, lack of career, careful career planning, and planned job assignments, and exclusion from informal networks of communications. Most CEOs felt it was the company's responsibility to change to meet the needs of women. The survey also showed that women are perceived 
as equally or better prepared than their male counterparts for business careers in terms of education, technical training, management skills, client relations, and interpersonal skills. And these were the skills most often mentioned by the CEOs as necessary to compete for top positions in their company. And many CEOs are taking steps to increase opportunities for women in management. But nonetheless, the process is cumbersome and slow, but increasing in pace as enlightenment comes. Discrimination, one of the ugliest barriers born of fear and ignorance, is not as imposing as it was 10 years ago, but still exists and can be heartless and, of course, is visited on both sexes. In my view, Hispanics will overcome this barrier as knowledge and appreciation of our talents and abilities become recognized and appreciated. So what can we do about these problems, conditions, and concerns? How do we in the Hispanic community deal with these problems as men and women? Some of the things that I believe each of us can do are, for example, each of us should strive to impart our knowledge of the unfair barriers we see throughout the Hispanic and general communities. And each of us should be willing to give up our time to Hispanic groups dedicated to the betterment of our community to, and through this benefit society overall. Each of us must recognize that as Hispanics we should be mindful of the plight of others and perhaps not as fortunate as we. And each of us must accept individual responsibility and accomplish those things we are capable of. I appreciate that many of you are doing these things now and I respect you for your work. But let us continue these actions and demonstrate that discrimination is counterproductive to good business, good government, and progress for all. Thank you. All right, we have two microphones um, so that people can ask questions. And I would start out uh, by asking the following question. And each of you touched a little bit on it in terms of either your personal background, your personal experience, or when uh, uh, Ms. Ortega, in, in your instance, also as, as a member of a banking organization. I would like to ask the question um, both in terms of Hispanics or Hispanic women, what have been traditionally the barriers to obtaining capital? And how are things changing so that Hispanics and Hispanic women can get access to capital so that they can take advantage of the opportunities of our revitalization of our economy? Who would like to proceed first? I'll take it. Jose? Uh, first of all, the USACC, when we organized 14 years ago, our biggest problem was access to capital. Well. 14 years later, that's still the biggest problem. Uh, money is not out there when you go to make a, you know, when you go to get a loan. It used to be that you could go out and get a loan on your signature. My dad used to get several thousand dollars on his signature alone when he went to a bank uh, that he needed extra money. Today, you can't do that. You, they take your house, they take your kids, they take everything. You can't do it. It is a major problem. We're addressing it right now uh, in Washington. With the, uh, with the Small Business Administration. We addressed it last year with the White House and we're gonna to continue to do that. Uh, it seems that we are, we are just part of the overall problem of finance in this country today. Uh, not only is there not enough financing for us, there's not enough financing for anybody. And the solution to it uh, is an overall solution that has to be done for all business and not just minority business. 
or Hispanic business, we get the, uh, the biggest flack of it because we're at the bottom of the totem pole. And, uh, and the, same, the same problem that we have in all other areas, uh, from insurance to financing to redlining that's going on, that's the bottom line. And uh, I, for one, can tell you that from our organization, we're pushing forward to uh, identify other sources. What we're doing is uh, we're helping Hispanic business by organizing um, capital development corporations by putting together special funds called ESBICs, Small Business Investment Corporations, that uh, through there we go out and we raise capital. We raise a million dollars and, and we challenge the government through, it, through its own laws to match it three to one, four to one, and then bring it out uh, into the community in, in small micro loans. Uh, these are initiatives that we're putting together ourselves uh, from California, New York, Miami, to Chicago, and, uh, and the other thing that we're doing is we're encouraging our business owners to do more of uh, getting Hispanics to buy your own banks and buy your own programs. But what's more attractive of an ESPIC corporation, a small business investment corporation, is that it can, has, it can act like a bank, but it doesn't fall under the same bank regulations. But we are working on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Tickett, do you have anything you'd like to say? Well, I might say it has especially been difficult for women. It's uh, somewhat easier now, but initially, uh, if a woman walked into a bank and uh, there wasn't a, a male with her, she was pretty much uh, out of the, uh, not going to get a loan, and because they wanted that male individual to co-sign with her, uh, much progress has been made along those lines. On the other hand, uh, from a small business individual's point of view, my recommendation has always been that when you're thinking about going into business, you establish a banking relationship very early on and that you make that contact with the loan officer where you're going to be doing the banking because it's much easier after you have developed a relationship with the loan officer that he or she can guide you in how to go about getting a loan either from that bank or other sources. Mr. Estrada? I was hoping to duck that question because our, our experience there has been very negative. Um, we, we've yet to get a loan. Um, I mean, the, the magazine is profitable and I, I couldn't get a loan today. That, that's partly because uh, a magazine doesn't really have any, any assets other than our good name, other than um, substantial advertising receivables. Uh, banks do not, uh, just as a matter of policy, do not lend against uh, advertising receivables. Uh, if, if, if I had had to, to rely on any kind of financing, I would never have started the magazine. Okay. Let's go uh, first to this microphone. If you could just briefly identify yourself and then uh, ask the question to the whole panel or any particular member. Okay. Um, my name is Jose Tello and I'm an undergraduate at Harvard. I have two questions. One is a general question for anyone who wishes to answer and another one for Mr. Estrada. Um, it's known that in um, in the nation at large, Hispanics have uh, difficulties in uniting. Uh, an outside Hispanic who uh, published an article last year on, on this issue. And I was wondering uh, how, how, what needs to be done in order for uh, Hispanics on, on a national level um, to unite and be better, more effective in the business world and, uh, economic, rural, political. Um, and also, uh, Mr. Starla, you said that um, your readership is uh, sort of like mainstream uh, Hispanics who are educated. Um, and uh, also you said that the, the magazine sort of like provides role models. Uh, how can you work to, to <clears throat> sort of like to get to the lower, uh, to the poor uh, Hispanics, to the ones who haven't made it yet, who are not educated, who can benefit from uh, reading the magazine? The, uh, the magazine's used quite a bit as a teaching tool in, in the classroom. And, and perhaps that's how we, you know, get, get to that segment of the community. Uh, again, by presenting positive role models, um, it, it, it's helpful in, in, in helping people to learn English. Um, so, so we've done things in, in that area, but there's no question that, we're, that our, our segment is a very specific market segment, um, which uh, tends to be a higher income group. That's why the magazine's in English. These are people who are, who are bilingual, uh, tend to be more comfortable in, in English. Um, 
my, my own my own history. I was born in Cuba, but I grew up in this country. So while while, while I'm fluent in Spanish, I'm much more comfortable in English. So so that's the, the segment we're reaching. But but I think the magazine has been effective in reaching other segments of the community through this educational aspect. Can I follow up on, on a question to him? Uh, one of the things that we did at the USACC uh, at the initiation of Hispanic Magazine is uh, we we got into an agreement with Hispanic Magazine that all members of the USACC or its local mem membership that uh, comes forth, uh, so long as we provide Hispanic Magazine with the with the listing of it, he would send them a one year's complimentary subscription of that magazine. And it doesn't matter what level of education they have, how big or how small their business is, uh, as an extra teaching tool, as, as an extra information tool. And it's worked very well. And you know, we thank Hispanic Magazine because the relationship has worked well. And the other issue that you asked about unity. Right. Uh, uh, I spoke first earlier today on how we do unity uh, in the part of business. Uh, we do it through economics, through the dollar. Uh, we bring uh, Mexicanos, Cubanos, Puerto Ricanos, everybody together under the auspices that everybody likes to have money. And through economic development, we all come together because that's one common thing that we have. Uh, but we've, we've tried to push it a little bit further. We've extended across. Uh, the USACC participates with 20, 27 other national Hispanic organizations, including LULAC, uh, La Raza, uh, National Council of La Raza, ASPIDA, uh, GI Forum, and so on. There's 28 organizations, and we put together what's known as the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. Uh, we've been together under that name for the last two years, and it's headquartered out of Washington, D.C. We have it staffed, and we bring all the national presidents together, and also we bring together another 28, both business, uh, businessmen, corporate people, educators, and so on, social people, that we invite to participate officially on this board. So we wind up with we have an official board of about 56, 57 right now. And we talk about the problems that are common to everybody in our community and how to bring the unity aspect closer together. Uh, one of the things that we talked about heavily was to first agree on what we were going to disagree on and then move from there on everything else that we could agree. Uh, it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, if nothing else, we have, we, we have everybody together at the table and we are talking and we encourage uh, any other groups, and we encourage all our own local groups from these organizations to meet in the cities that where they're at to also do the similar thing so we can get this unity relationship going. Here. Um, I had a question uh, to Mr. Estrada. I'm doing a study on uh, television coverage in San Antonio on Hispanics, similar to what you did with the bad news story. But um, I'm also trying to link it in with that they get better coverage what sort of revenues from advertising they, could, they might be able to receive. And one thing that was brought to my attention was that in San Antonio, uh, five, less than 5% actually watch the Spanish language television. There's a misnomer that, to advertisers that you can only reach Hispanics through Spanish language media. And I wanted to see what you have sort of gauged as the perceptions by advertisers, big advertisers, small advertisers, of their perception of Hispanic consumers and what they think is the best method of reaching them, and if you could sort of propose a more effective way. Well, there, there are a lot of, of misconceptions out there about, about the community, as, as I think you've, you've, you've encountered. Um, what's important to realize is, again, I, I keep coming back to this issue of segmentation. There, there's no question that of the 30 million Hispanics, there's a segment there that, that well, first of all, doesn't speak any Spanish at all, mm -hmm. and, and possibly fourth, fifth generation may not even consider themselves Hispanics. Um, there's no question a segment possibly at the other end of the, of, the, of the spectrum which doesn't speak any English. These are most likely very recent immigrants, uh, possibly undocumented immigrants, uh, people outside the economic mainstream. And I, I would call that something in the range of possibly 10 to 15 percent. Uh, everybody else, call, call it the other 80 percent, is, is probably bilingual in, in, in varying degrees. And that's really the audience people are, are getting at. Um, the, the, the two large Spanish language networks, Telemundo and Univision, are actually owned by a uh, very large economic interest. Telemundo is owned by Saul Steinberg, a New York-based financier. Um, Univision is owned by a consortium that includes uh, Mexican billionaire Emilio Azcárraga and a number of people in the entertainment industry. So essentially, they're, they're, neither one is owned by, by US, U.S. Hispanics. Their, their pitch, if, if, if you will, is that, is that Hispanics don't speak English that the only way to reach Hispanics is, is through Spanish. 
Now, as, as, a, as a marketing pitch, that's been somewhat effective in, in, in terms of reaching corporate America. The, the misconception, I think, is in the size of the segment, because they're claiming that the entire community doesn't speak English, um, as opposed to that, that 15%. I, I believe that's, that's wrong. Um, I, I think the, the, uh, the bulk of the community is, is bilingual. A lot of the programming that you see on these networks tends to be the novelas, the soap operas, essentially Latin American programming that, that's simply um, broadcast in the U.S. has very little relation to U.S. culture. Our magazine, for example, we're not really concerned what's happening in, 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 in Mexico, Caracas, Buenos Aires, except for some specific international issues, primarily in business. We're concerned what's happening in San Antonio, in Miami, here in, here in Boston with the U.S. US Hispanic community. Um, and I think one, one offshoot of this is, is um, the, the, the lack of positive images on television. A lot of what you see on Spanish language television tends to be very stereotypical uh, views of, of Hispanics. Um, not a lot of attention to issues like education, not a lot of attention to issues like, like business. Uh, I'd like to see, for example, more Hispanics on mainstream network television. Why don't we have a, a, a successful Hispanic sitcom, for example? Why don't we have uh, programs that deal with, with issues important to Hispanics? Uh, in, in Washington, um, you know, we've got uh, 20, uh, 20 pundits on, on, on Sunday morning. Why aren't any of them Hispanic? Why don't they address Hispanic issues? Um, that's the progression I'd, I'd like to see in the next few years. Okay. I was just going to follow, but I'll follow. Yes. Hello. Um, I was interested in like how America is called the melting pot. And I'm, I had a small construction business and I've worked all around Boston. And I don't see it that way. All I see is neighborhoods. Like I see Spanish neighborhoods and I see black neighborhoods and I see Chinese neighborhoods. And I don't see any homogenization of the, of the American. It's like that in every big city you go to. So where is this melting pot that we speak of, you know? And, but I've had the pleasure of working in these various neighborhoods and meeting these different nationalities and such, and, and it's been benefit to my life. But, I, but a, a lot of Americans don't get the experience to do that. And they have, like, it's like an us and them attitude. You know what I'm saying? I live in the suburbs where, it's, where there's, I don't think it's an Hispanic person in the entire town on the South Shore. And there's, and there's a lot of the us and them, you know, like the, the isolation. We can isolate ourselves in a nice town away from it all. And like the problems with the people in the city is their problems. You know, it's not ours to worry about. And you know, when I was in, in myself, I was a tradesman and I worked, I, I've hired, you know, people from just about all nationalities at one time or another. You know, I'm, but I've seen prejudice in my travels, you know, and it's ugly. It's real ugly. And I've, and I've seen that there's no reason for it to exist. And, and I think that the separation that is around everywhere you look in America doesn't have to exist. If there was, a, if there was somehow that the Americans population could move towards homogenization, you know what I'm saying? Where, where there, there wasn't split up into these, I quote a biblical saying like, a mind divided is no mind at all. You ever heard that? That's sort of the state that America is in at this point. And uh, I think that a lot of the problems wouldn't exist if the people were living more side by side instead of isolated from each other and, and, as the situation ex exists now. I assume the question that you're asking, in addition to the comments, which I appreciate, is what can the different communities, in particular the Hispanic community, do to help in that unity uh, effort, while at the same time perhaps recognizing and preserving some of the benefits of their culture? And I would ask that just as a general question to the panel. Well, first of all, with us, uh, again, we, we started to do the programs of the unity that I spoke earlier within the Hispanic community, but the, the outreach that is being done 
within the greater segment. I know that I could talk in Chicago, where I'm from, or where I spent most of my life. Uh, working with the mayor, we put together a, an office that, that extends out to the community to, uh, to do different programs to, to bring more integration between the people so that they could work more to, closer together. And we, from the business aspect, point, or from the business point of view, what we're doing is uh, we try to extend as much as we can on, on joint ventures with uh, non-Hispanic businesses, uh, both into the black community, the Asian community, and the, uh, the white community, so that we could um, work with them in joint ventures and specific projects. And hopefully out of doing this, uh, we can increase the relationships within our, you know, within our community as minimal as it might be. It's a start that we're doing. Anybody else want to speak to this? Okay, let me go to the next speaker. Hello, I'm Isidro Gonzalez. I'm a graduate of MIT. And um, if we use Mr. Estrada's numbers, um, there are 500,000 readers of Hispanic magazine, assume they're all mainstreamed, and the population right now is up 30 million, um, growing at about 59%. So that's less than 2% of the population mainstreamed. Um, my question refers to the process of Hispanization of the country, which really has two components. One is moving some of the 98% of the people more into the mainstream, and the other is the people who are in the mainstream educating the rest of the population to the benefits of the, our culture. If our culture, is, if our population is growing so quickly, the rate at, that this is happening is very, very slow. We've only got 2% in the last 30 years of progress. So my question is, what kinds of things should the people in the mainstream do to help this rate become faster? Um, is there a role for, say, government programs uh, other than just being in the mainstream and being ourselves? I, I, I wouldn't assume that, that um, the mainstream is exclusively our readership. For, 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 Just for, as an indicator. For, for, I mean, to give you an idea of the census, for example, by the census figures, roughly 15% of the Hispanic community can be, can be considered, for example, white collar. And even that's a very rough definition of the mainstream. But, but even by that, let's say it's, it, it's 5 million, so just as one point. But, but I, I, think it's, I think it's important, you say moving into the, the mainstream, what, what, what I mean is, it, it, I don't mean an exclusionary term. Just because you're in the mainstream, you don't exclude other parts of your of your heritage by mainstream I mean participating in the economic life of this of this country um, that that's how I would define the mainstream and and but in in so doing uh, I, I we, we stress in the magazine it's very important to retain what it is about you that that, that makes your life worthwhile uh, and, and for, for for many of us it's our Hispanic heritage it's, it's what we're all about I don't see a conflict there I, I remember in um in, in a similar form of this um, a few years ago at another, at another school, um, uh, a, a young a student asked me, well, you know, if, if, if you're successful, you've done that, how do I know you didn't, you didn't sell out? You know, and, 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 and in his mind, that was an important distinction, that if you were successful, that you were somehow selling out your Hispanic identity. And, and, and we stress that, that that's really a, a, a false choice. Um, we don't see it uh, necessary or even desirable to, to sell out your, your Hispanic identity. I, I think what, what, uh, what people can do in our community, some of the things that, that uh, Ms. Davos Ortega mentioned, is, is important to get involved in, in civic organizations that are, that are doing things to benefit the Hispanic community. Um, it's important where you are to, to get involved. Let's say you're, you're in a corporation. Well, it, it's, it's important to, to act as a mentor to other Hispanics entering that corporation. At, in, in a school like, like Harvard or MIT, well, there are, there are other uh, students coming here from other communities. Uh, it's important to act as a mentor to, the, to these kids. It's not so easy to adjust to these types of environments. But I think that's one way to bring other people into this, into this mainstream, which is our objective. And in the business community? In the business community, our growth has been in the last, in the last 10 years. Um, our better days are just ahead of us. If you look at the, the statistics that I gave you uh, the, and the implementation for those statistics, we see that by the beginning of the next millennium uh, will bring tremendous growth to us. So what that is doing is, is that what we now are doing today, those that, that have and those that can, and yourselves and so on, 
well, it's our responsibility to help the, everybody else. I believe heavily that if the USHCC and our chamber networks were doing that right now with the actions that we're doing, and uh, I'm doing it myself by being here today. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Frank Moreno, and I'm a sophomore here at the college, and I have two questions, both which are addressed to all three panelists, although the first one would probably have to deal with, more with Senor Nino. My first question is that it is said that the world is becoming increasingly smaller and that telecommunications are playing a much larger role in business. My question for you is how are Hispanics businesses here in the United States reacting to that aspect that is changing in the world and how are they working and dealing with what the types of businesses are going out beyond the borders here in the United States and taking on the other countries and more importantly how are they dealing with the reaction to the increasing importance of high technology in this type of world? Okay. Uh, the first part of your question that just deals in general with uh, how we're dealing and how we're Hispanic business getting together uh, in an international arena. Let me say that very basic, we have been involved in in international trade, like I told you, by bringing in those products that we normally use. But let's take it beyond that. Uh, the businesses that are associated with us today are very interested in what international is going to be for the future. But there's a sense in all of America today of um, the globalization of business. And it's what I call the, the global economic revolution. And that we're going into a, another series now in which there's going to be a big jump of doing business because no more can we just do business and compete with just each other. Uh, it used to be that we, we competed across the, the neighborhoods and then we competed across the country with other small businesses, but now our competition is clear across the world. And there is, uh, with the education and the information that's being brought forth on the North American Free Trade Agreement, a lot of Hispanic business businesses say, boy, there's a great opportunity there. I'm gonna make a lot of money, I'm gonna get into international trade, I'm going forward with it. Well, reality is there's going to be a lot of losers and a lot of people are going to lose money uh, because they're not well prepared, because they don't know anything about international trade, and because they don't want to take any advice. Uh, when I told you earlier that you take one, two, three, at three courses in international trade as your electives, you're I'm very serious. And the reason being that in business, if these people, they can, they can avoid all of that and they can make the money, they can do the big business, but what they have to do is they gotta go find out who knows how to deal in international trade. Uh, they have to go to the people that have the export trading companies. They have to go to the international consultants that, have, that know how to work and, and, and do this business. And let me tell you, there are a lot of Hispanic owned businesses that are interested in this and are attending seminars and matchmaking sessions. We at the USACC, for example, have put matchmaking sessions together on international trade. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be going down to Monterrey, Mexico, where we're taking uh, 80 chambers with us, the representatives from those chambers, putting them together with the 120 representatives from the different chambers throughout Mexico and the Canadians, and we're sitting them, well, number one, we're educating them more on what the North American Free Trade Agreement is, but more important, about international trade. And number two, we're putting them together with other business owners in Canada and Mexico that do similar types of businesses or similar products so they can go into business together. Uh, that is one way that we're doing it. And number two, you asked about the technical arena. Uh, the technical arena is real, it, it's new. It's new not only to Hispanics, again, it's new to everybody. But I, uh, uh, I can tell you that we have uh, several Hispanic companies that are going into that big time. Uh, we have Hispanic owned companies that, that are into fiber optics, that are not only construction companies that are now laying the cable for it, but that are, are uh, participating in the splicing of that, of that technology, in the, uh, in the shooting off of that technology, not only in the si Silicon Valley of California, but even most important for this particular type of work being done in Colorado. Uh, for, for most of you that, that don't know Colorado, especially the Denver area, is a high-tech communications arena where a lot of the major corporations uh, are setting up their uh, the, their companies due to the fact that they get all the satellite information now, all the satellite feedbacks into that part of the country. It's got to do with the altitude and, and how high or above everybody else that they are in altitude and the companies are set up there. And there's a lot of companies that are researching and getting more involved into the technical arena. There is, uh, there is also some business owners that are putting together now uh, seminars on 
technical procedures and technical opportunities in this field. And we are, uh, are with uh, AT&T and MCI and U.S. Sprint, we're getting involved in that telecommunication process and bringing Hispanic-owned businesses into that arena beyond uh, supplying paper, beyond supplying construction. We want to get into the technical end of it and bringing those people forth already. Thank you. And th my second okay. question was this, is that for a very long time now, Hispanics have not been a major influence in business here in the United States. And, and at the same time, we've managed, it's been said we've managed to retain much of our culture. And at times, it's been said we've stubbornly adhered to not assimilating as other groups might have. Now, is business and Hispanic, the Hispanic community tend to look to work together more and more? That, I, in my opinion, will, should create several changes. Or do you, my, actually my question would be to you, do you, how do you believe that as Hispanics increasingly become more involved in business, that it will affect our culture? For example, it's been, for a very long time, women were, were not allowed to work or to go out and that's been just, if nothing else, history and tradition. And of course, that's changing now. And what do you think that'll do to the fiber or the fabric of the Hispanic community? I frankly don't ha don't believe it will have that much of an impact on the fiber of the uh, of the Hispanic family. I have seen numerous examples where Hispanic women have gone out and started their own businesses primarily because they didn't feel they could, uh, they encountered uh, the glass ceiling or other barriers out in the workplace, and as a result of that, that motivated them to go out and start their own businesses. And in most cases, uh, the families have ended up working with them in the business, and I think it has uh, brought the family together even in a stronger way than in another setting. Uh, let me tell you, in my position, I have an opportunity to travel all over the country, and I see a lot of chambers of commerce, business owners, everywhere. And the more that we get involved in business, although you know, change is good because we have to get into other things, but as far as our cultures are concerned, let me tell you that when I have go to Minneapolis, Minnesota, business owners there, I go to a reception, and uh, it's not hot dogs and hamburgers. It's platanos y uh, arroz con habichuelas and so on. When I go up to uh, come over to Connecticut to see these Mexicans over there and work with the Mexican business owners there, I mean, they had mariachis y tamales and uh, the culture, they, they kept everything, the, the dress, the way, you know, it, the sense of feeling, the sense of family, uh, the love of God, their, uh, what their roots come from, it's all there. And no matter where you go in this country, I believe heavily that the, the opportunity of economic advancement only adds to our own opportunity to procure or to get those things that we need to have here to relate more to our own cultures. Because con el dinero lo podemos comprar. So Hi, my name is Sylvia Trujillo, and I'm here at the Kennedy School getting my master's in public policy. I have two separate questions, and it's for all of the panelists. The first is, um, all of you have mentioned, or at least two of you have mentioned, a commitment to um, working with Latinos or ensuring Latinos have equal representation within the business community. And I'm wondering what efforts are being done um, throughout the community specifically to ensure that the practice within the dominant society of relegating women to secondary position is not, in fact, happening within the Hispanic business community now that it's in its nascent stages and so that it doesn't become structured within how Latinos and Latinas interact. And my second question has to do with the business community as a whole, once again, and what do they see their role in the current crisis or the ongoing crisis that we have in our community among our young people and the lack of education that they're receiving and the worries that in the future if our continual, con that dropout rates continue at the rate that they are within our community, that we in fact won't be able to have um, a business community or for that matter any type of community um, without the preparation at the most basic levels. 
You know, I might refer you to the uh, to, to the cover story of our March issue, which which um, reads "Latino versus Latina is is machismo dead," and and I think the conclusion was the machismo is not dead, but but still very much alive in in, in our in our society, uh, particularly among Hispanics. I remember we interviewed a, a very prominent Hispanic businesswoman uh, who, who noted that 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 for her. Um, a lot of a lot of her, her Latino male counterparts were not very supportive. In fact, were very threatened by her success. And some of the most supportive people were, were, were non-Hispanic Latino, uh, non-Hispanic uh, males. And, and in this regard, she, she felt that many Hispanic females were also threatened by her success. There's clearly a long a long way to go. I don't think that's unique to Hispanics. So I think the whole issue of gender is becoming very explosive. <coughs> In, in our society, I think one proof of that is, is the, the media images of Hillary Clinton. I mean, one, one day she's um, you know, this determined, savvy political operative, and, and uh, she's a genius. The next day she's Lady Macbeth, and she's running the whole show. So it, it's really very schizophrenic. So it doesn't surprise me that you, you still find those kinds of conflicts in the Hispanic community. Um, let me tell you, as, much, as macho as we might be, uh, it was most important for us at the USATC, for the Hispanic businessmen, to include women in everything we do uh, as equals. We have them on our board of directors and all our local chambers. We have many of them that are presidents. And what we did is, at our national convention every year, uh, we dedicate one whole session to just them. We, we participate with them and all of them, but we do a tribute to Hispanic women in business all and showcase them before the world. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to say that under my watch, as president and CEO, we were able to elect our, our, our first woman, female, uh, chairman of the board of the USHCC to preside over the, all the Hispanic Chambers of Commerce nationally in 1992, uh, the year in which you know, a lot of people say you know, we're 500 years old in this country, and we had a woman at the, at the helm of our national organization, uh, which today she sits on on the Federal Commission, on the, the Glass Ceiling Commission, and uh, she's a very successful woman all on her own. We have several other women that sit on our board of directors today that are two of them, which are regional chairs uh, for our organization. And to the other point, that of uh, lack of education for the future and, and preparation, let me tell you that not only are our chambers involved in providing scholarships, there's a lot of uh, chambers, for example, the Dallas Hispanic Chamber of Commerce provides up to uh, 50,000 and 50 individual scholarships apiece. Uh, the, the scholarships that are provided in California, almost all our chambers provide some type of scholarships for the local, for students that want to continue their education. We ourselves have a, an internship program at the USHCC in which we bring in 15 interns every year and we put them to work at our national headquarters for the whole summer. Uh, on top of that, we keep, we maintain at least two or three interns throughout each semester at our national headquarters in which we do participation for them to get involved in, in business direct. And we encourage all our local chambers to do the same thing. Uh, but it is a big issue. Myself, I sit on the board, I sit on a, on a business coalition on education along with the 10 presidents of uh, 10 other organizations, uh, the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Manufacturer Association, and several others, and we, we see on, on not just Hispanic education or Hispanic youth education, but overall education for youth in this country. Uh, so we're very involved with that right now. And I would say I have seen there in Washington more and more your Hispanic organizations are, have representation of women almost 50-50 in many cases, and I think it's up to uh, women such as you in the audience to continue to be aggressive and uh, participate and be part uh, of those organizations that will be making the changes in the future. Okay, just one last observation, a quick question. One last we question, to... actually. Okay. First, just the observation how, it's, I think it's sort of funny that you say there's a woman as chairman. I mean, that's, but. That's what you wanted to call herself. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, mm, okay, I, my second. I call her chairperson or our chair, and you know, she says, Madam Chair, she says, no, you call me chairman. I'll call you anything you want, but all I know is you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly, your last question. Okay, yeah, one of the up. panelists mentioned the glass ceiling, and to me it seems that there are two different groups that when you go along business. You have those who pursue Hispanic-owned businesses and those who work their way up to the corporations. 
Now with the glass ceiling, I'm not really too familiar with it, but do you feel that, how does that affect people who try to work up individually through these corporations? And does that have any effect on those a desire to maybe want to have their own business instead? Well, I think that's true that uh, uh, not only women, but many minorities have, that have uh, joined corporations and try to work their way up, they get up to a certain level and they're excluded from going further. And uh, in the past, it has been said that it's because those making the choice as to who's going to continue, who's going to get in above that ceiling have been white males. And they have tended to select others like them. And so, of course, now with uh, the many uh, laws, the Office of Contract Compliance, uh, putting pressure on corporate America, uh, there is definitely a trend towards opening it up. As uh, someone here mentioned, this uh, glass ceiling commission that it was established by originally by Secretary Dole when she was at Labor, and they have continued this commission. And uh, from the corporations that I'm serving on, I can certainly see that uh, they're very much aware and are trying to correct this. In a lot of cases, they say the pool is not there, especially relating to women. But they are coming up, and um, I myself am optimistic um, as far as women are concerned, and that uh, more will break that glass ceiling. You know, the, the issue of the glass ceiling is, is a pervasive one in, in, in our society. I mean, it affects people in corporations as well as in small business and in all, all, all areas of, of endeavor. But I think it's important to note that, that uh, diversity um, isn't really a buzzword anymore. It's, 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 it's a fact of life. And it's, it's a corporate necessity. Um, a, a study came out a couple of years ago, Workforce 2000. By the year 2000, 85% of the incoming workforce at that time, new entrants to the workforce will be minorities and women. Um, what, what, what that means is, is any company um, doing business today that is not aware, that is not cognizant of the need for workforce diversity will not do well, will probably not be around in, in, in 10, 15, 20 years. Those companies that are aware of the need for workforce diversity and are doing things like bringing Hispanics up the corporate ladder and, 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 and breaking the glass ceiling are the companies that will do well. And, and, and the companies that are profitable, that are successful, are very much aware of that. So, so, that it, so, so workforce diversity is, is the reality of, of, of the 90s. OK, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Estrada, Mr. Nino, Ms. Davalos Ortega, I want to thank you very much on behalf of um, the Kennedy School for your thoughtful. Thank you very much. Your remarks have been very thoughtful and enlightening, and uh, you've demonstrated again to each of us that each of you are bright and talented, who in addition to being successful leaders and good role models, are also Hispanic, and we thank you. Uh, to you in the audience, uh, I wish to thank you for coming to listen to this presentation. Finally, I want to thank the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Forum on Hispanic Affairs and uh, I believe uh, our guest speakers will be able to stick around for just a little bit and informally we can chat with them. Thank you and have a good day.